So if there's anything that I understood about my audience in the past three or so years of running this channel, is that you guys really seem to like my VPN videos. The two of my videos about VPN seem to get the most attention on my channel with a huge margin. And, well, I like attention, so here I am back with another banger, I guess. So a lot of you guys ask me in the comments on those two VPN videos, Wolfgang, look, I, I don't trust those VPN companies and VPS companies. I don't want to spend my hard-earned dollars every month to pay for some kind of a VPS or VPN service. Can't I just host a VPN at home in the comfort of my own house? And the answer to that question is, well, it depends. So let's talk real quick about why people use VPNs in the first place. Here are some of the most common use cases for a VPN. Getting access to your home or corporate network securely while being somewhere else. Protecting yourself in a hostile or an unsecured network on an airport or a cafe Wi-Fi. Or in some cases, avoiding tracking and surveillance by a malicious ISP at school or at work. Tricking websites into thinking that you're in a different country to get access to some kind of a geo-restricted content. Circumventing censorship and getting access to stuff that is normally blocked by your your ISP or your government, and last but not least, piracy. Downloading illegal stuff in countries where doing that on your normal ISP connection would get you a hefty fine or a warning. Now obviously those are not all things that you can use a VPN for, because if I listed all the use cases, we'll be sitting here all day. But basically one thing that is common about all of those cases is that people usually use a VPN to pretend they're somewhere else, for many reasons. And if you want to host your VPN at home, it will be useful for you only when you need to pretend that you're at home. Does that make sense? For example, you want to be out and about somewhere in a cafe and you want to connect to the unsecured Wi-Fi hotspot. And if you don't quite trust the network that you're connecting to, you can just establish a secured encrypted tunnel to your own house to browse the internet safely as though you were at home. And of course, if you have a home lab or a home server, you can get access to all of your local services securely without the need of exposing them to the internet. This setup might also come in handy for you if you often travel to countries where you can't turn or visit certain websites, or maybe if you want to watch your local TV shows while you're abroad. So all of that begs the question, why not just use a VPN? Well, first of all, no monthly costs. The only thing you need to pay is the upfront cost for the hardware. I'll be using a Raspberry Pi here, and it costs about 60 bucks with all the accessories, but we'll also talk about cheaper alternatives later in the video. The second reason is that you don't have to trust any third party. If you watched some of my previous videos about VPNs, you know my opinions about VPN providers, they can be pretty sketchy, but in this case you are literally your own VPN provider. As long as you trust your ISP more than you trust a random unsecured network in a cafe, you're good to go. And then last but not least, accessing your local services securely while you're on the go. I already mentioned that one, so I won't be going too much in depth here. Now let's talk about the requirements. So what are you gonna need for this project? First of all, you need basic technical skills. We won't be doing any PhD level nuclear science here, but you will need some basic knowledge of, you know, using a computer, some Google Foo, and basic problem solving skills. A lot of people in the comments have been asking me, look Wolfgang, is there like a way for like less technically savvy people to do all of that? And unfortunately, that's just the entry price you have to pay for that kind of stuff. You can either get yourself a VPN service subscription and have no insight as what's going on behind the curtains or who's getting your data, where it goes to, etc. Or you can spend some time and do everything yourself. And yes, it might be technically challenging, but you do get some kind of a control over what you do and where your data goes to. I'll keep this tutorial as simple as possible and the video will be divided into chapters and you can use the YouTube speed setting if I'm going a little bit too fast for you. And I will also include a text version of this guide in the video description, so make sure you take a look at that if you like this format better. All in all, I think it's a cool weekend project and definitely a good learning experience. So let's talk about the technical requirements now. First thing you'll need is a dedicated internet connection and access to your router's admin panel. If you're connected to the public Wi-Fi in your student dorm, unfortunately that's just not going to work. Then you'll need an ISP that is okay with you hosting stuff at home. Here in Germany where I live, most of the ISPs will let you host stuff at home just fine, except for the mail for some reason. A lot of ISPs are blocking the port 25 for outgoing mail here. But in other countries, some ISPs might put your internet connection behind a shared IP address and only offer a dedicated IP address as a business service or something that you have to pay for extra. If you want an easy way to know whether your ISP is dedicated or shared, you can go to a website like whoware.net and see if it maybe says that you're behind a proxy. And if it does, that's a pretty good indicator that your PC won't be accessible from the internet, so that tutorial is not going to work for you, unfortunately. You'll also need a 
Twitter router that supports a function called port forwarding. The easiest way to check is open your browser and go to your router's administration panel. Usually it's something like 192.168.0.1 or 1.1 and look for a function called port forwarding. I've had about four routers here in Germany and they all support that function. One more thing you'll need is a computer that will basically live in your house and be on 24 7. It doesn't have to be super powerful or beefy if you have like an old laptop or a netbook laying around that will do just fine. For this tutorial though I'll use a tiny computer called Raspberry Pi. I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with it. It's small, relatively cheap and has a very low power consumption. You can even run it off of solar energy if you want. Do keep in mind that apart from the board itself you also need a power adapter and at least an 8GB microSD card. I wouldn't cheap out on microSD cards because you know inexpensive microSD cards from Aliexpress tend to break much faster than you know the brand ones from Kingston, Transcend and other brands, so do keep that in mind. Optionally, if you do have a monitor, a keyboard and a mouse somewhere in the house, I would suggest buying a micro HDMI to HDMI adapter. That way you can connect your Raspberry Pi directly to your monitor, keyboard and the mouse and it'll be a little bit easier to set up. But if you don't have a monitor or a TV that supports HDMI, that's okay too, we'll go over the whole setup process later in the video. You'll also need an Ethernet cable and a micro SD card reader if your computer doesn't already have that one. Otherwise, if you don't pay a lot for electricity where you live and you don't care about the place the computer takes or the noise, you can take whatever you have laying around, just make sure it has Ethernet port and that it's capable of running 64-bit operating systems. That being said, I will only be covering the setup process for Raspberry Pi in this video, but do let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a separate video on this topic on how to set up a VPN on a regular computer such as a laptop or a netbook. Now with all the requirements and disclaimers out of the way, let's get started. First thing we need to do is download the operating system for a Raspberry Pi. Depending on whether you're setting it up with a monitor or without one, you can download either Raspberry Pi Desktop, which looks like that, or Raspberry Pi Lite, which looks kind of like that. If you're doing it with a monitor or a TV though, the former has a benefit of being able to open a browser and copy commands from a handy dandy text guide, which I'll put in the video description down below. Now I must say that Raspberry Pi OS is a bit controversial and got into a bit of trouble lately for including Microsoft's repositories in the installation. So if you're a diehard Linux veteran and you don't want to contaminate your home network with the evil Microsoft software, feel free to choose something else. Personally, I can recommend Ubuntu Mate or Mate if you prefer as a solid alternative. Next thing we need to do is download Etcher. Etcher is a tool that will help us write the operating system that we just downloaded to the microSD card. I chose Etcher because it runs on Windows, Linux and Mac OS. But if you have some other tool that you prefer, such as DD or Rufus, you can use that instead. After you have both Etcher and Raspberry Pi on your computer, you can now insert the microSD card into your computer. Then launch Etcher, choose the Raspberry Pi OS image that you just downloaded, select your microSD card and click flash. This is going to take some time so feel free to grab a cup of coffee or tea while you're waiting. After the flashing is done, you'll see a new volume in this PC menu called boot. Go to that volume, create a new text file and call it ssh. Be careful, it's not ssh.txt, it's ssh without any extension. To do that, you need to have the Hide Extensions for Known File Types option disabled in the File Explorer options. With that done, you can now eject the microSD card from your computer. Now put the SD card into the Raspberry Pi, plug your Ethernet cable into the router and into the board, then finally plug the USB Type-C cable into it. In case you want to set up your Raspberry Pi with a monitor, you also need to plug in the monitor, the keyboard and the mouse into it at this point. So once you've booted your Raspberry Pi up, you will be presented with a very nice setup wizard which will actually let you skip a huge portion of this video. Just follow the instructions on the screen and reboot your Pi when asked. And now you can skip to this timecode. See you there. Now you need to wait for about a couple of minutes while your little computer is booting up. And then let's open the browser again and go to the router's administration panel. Go to the page that lists all of the devices connected to the network and there it is. Just copy the IP address of the Raspberry Pi here. Now we need to open the command line interface. On Mac and Linux it's called Terminal and on Windows we're going to be using PowerShell. That's really the only difference for us since we're only going to be using it to talk to a Raspberry Pi. So if you're on Windows, go to the start menu and search for PowerShell. Open it and type this command, ssh pi at and here paste the IP of the Raspberry Pi. You can use command C as usual on Mac 
On Linux, you can use Control Shift C or sometimes Control Alt C. And on Windows, just right click on the terminal and it's going to paste the text. Answer yes to the next question and type Raspberry when asked for password. The password won't be shown on the screen, not even the asterisks or like circles. And that applies to all the password fields in the Linux command line interface. So don't worry about it. First thing we need to do is change the default password to something more secure. We won't be exposing a Raspberry Pi to the internet per se, so you'll only be able to access it from your house. Because of that, I won't be going in depth about advanced SSH login security in this video, but if you're interested, you can check out this tutorial of mine where I discuss different methods of securing your remote access. So in order to change the password, you need to type passwd, type your current password, Raspberry, and then type your new password twice. And that's it. Next thing we're gonna do is update our operating system to all the latest versions of software. For that, type sudo apt update, double ampersand, sudo apt upgrade. This will take a few minutes depending on your internet speed, and meanwhile you can make yourself another tea, stare at the blinking lights in Raspberry Pi, or sing some sea shanties. After the installation is complete, and you see the green command prompt again, type sudo reboot to reboot the board. Now that we're done with the initial preparations, we need to get ourselves a dynamic DNS host name. The thing is, unless you're using a business broadband connection, your external IP address is not static, it changes every week or so. IP addresses work pretty much in the same way as physical addresses work, so let's say you have a house in New York and are waiting for an important letter, but then next week you have to move to, let's say, Los Angeles. How can you be sure that you get that letter? Well, you set up a mail forwarding service which gets all the letters for you, and forwards them to your current address. A dynamic DNS service is kind of a mail forwarding service, but for computers. Now, there are a lot of DDNS providers out there, some of them free, some of them with a subscription plan. For this tutorial, I'll be using a free plan from freedns.afraid.org. That being said, you can use any service you want, I am not endorsing any particular one, and the only reason I chose freedns.afraid.org is because that's the first free dynamic DNS service I found on Google that doesn't have any weird limitations. After registering on a website and activating your account via email, click on the add a subdomain. Here the things that we need to change are subdomain, just put whatever you want here, I'm going to put Wolfgang's VPN, domain, there are a few funny domain names here to choose from, and I decided to go with crapdance.com. Destination, by default, is going to have your current IP address in there, but we need to change it to 0.0.0. .0. That way we'll be able to test if our dynamic IP assignment software actually works. After that, type in the CAPTCHA and click on save. Now we need to log back to our Raspberry Pi by typing ssh pi at the IP address in PowerShell or Terminal. You can also just press the up arrow key and that will give you the last command you entered. Next, enter the password that we created earlier. Now we need to install a piece of software called ddclient. For that, type sudo apt install ddclient and press enter. It's going to ask you for a lot of things, just pretend you don't know anything by typing enter until it gives up. Now we need to tell ddclient which address it needs to update. For that, type sudo nano slash etc slash ddclient.conf. Let's just delete all of those lines and replace them with this convenient template that you can find in my text guide in the description. Here we need to replace several things. Login and password, replace them with your afraid.org credentials and subdomain.moo.org. Replace them with the domain name that you chose. After that's done, press Ctrl O to save the file and Ctrl X to exit. Another file that we need to edit is slash etc slash default slash dgclients. Here we need to change everything to no except for this option, run underscore daemon. This one we need to change to yes. Once that's done, Ctrl O, Ctrl X. Now that all of the configuration is done, let's restart the DD client service by using sudo systemctl restart ddclient and see what it's been up to by typing sudo systemctl status ddclient. As you can see, it actually says failed in all caps, but if we go back to our browser and refresh the page with our subdomain, you'll see that 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 .0 changed to our actual real IP address, which means it worked. Finally, let's make sure that ddclient starts automatically every time we power our Raspberry Pi on by typing sudo systemctl enable ddclient. Now, one last thing that we need to do before actually setting up the VPN is making sure that our VPN is accessible from the outside of the home network. For that, go to your router's admin page and go to the port forwarding settings. On Fritzbox routers, it's called permit access for some reason. What we need to do here is add another device for sharing. Here on most routers, you'll be able to pick a device from a list. So I'm gonna pick Raspberry Pi here. Then we need to create a new port forwarding entry. Here in the field application, I'm going to select other application. And for the name, let's enter WireGuard. 
For the protocol, make sure to select UDP. And as for the port, we need to forward the port 51820. On a lot of routers, you'll need to select two ports, so from port and to port. Just select 51820 in both. And then make sure that internet access is allowed via IPv4 and IPv6. Then apply the settings and that's it. As usual with computers, the hardest part of a project is often preparing for it. Now we're finally ready to actually install and set up our VPN, and this is really the easiest part of the video. To set it up, we're going to be using a WireGuard install script from the GitHub user NYR. I've been using this script on my personal machines for a few months, and it's really solid and reliable like a clockwork. Let's copy this command from the GitHub page, go back to our terminal, and paste it. As you can see, this command actually needs root privileges to run, so we need to type sudo bash wireguard install.sh. The script is going to ask us for the host name that we want to use for the VPN. Type your dynamic DNS domain that we created earlier. For client name, just put any name you want. And for DNS, this is kind of personal preference. I like to use the third option, 1.1.1.1. So if you're unsure, just use that. And that's it. Let's just press F here and the installation is going to begin. So as you can see, the WireGuard VPN is now installed and we have a big beautiful QR code right here on the screen, which we're going to use to connect to our VPN from the phone. Now you can simply download the WireGuard application from App Store or Google Play, launch the app and click on the plus button. Here, choose from a QR code and scan the code on the screen. And that's it. Now you might want to ask, why test it on a phone? Why not just use the same computer that we're using to set everything up? Well, the catch 22 here is that we can't test a VPN on the home network because we're already on the home network. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn off the Wi-Fi on my phone and then try to connect to our VPN on the cellular network to see if my IP changes. And as you can see, after connecting to the WireGuard VPN, I can now see the IP of my home internet connection. And since I'm technically browsing the internet from my house, I can now access all of my self-hosted network services as though I were at home. And that's it. Now, connecting to our home-baked VPN from a computer requires a few additional steps. First, we need to move the configuration files to our home directory. For that, log into the Raspberry Pi from the terminal and type sudo su, enter, and then cp slash root slash asterisk dot conf space slash home slash pi. Next, we need to create a folder for all of our WireGuard configuration files. Now, let's go to that folder, hold shift, right-click on the empty space, and click open PowerShell window here. Here you can press the up arrow key, replace SSH with SFTP, and press enter. After you've entered the password, you can now copy all of the configuration files to your machine. For that, type get space asterisk dot conf and press enter. Now that we're done here, let's type exit and close the PowerShell windows. WireGuard VPN is cross-platform, meaning you can use it on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. For Windows, we need to download this file, click on the executable, and now we're ready to install our configuration file. Launch WireGuard from the start menu and press add tunnel configuration from a file. Now I'm going to create a Wi-Fi hotspot on my phone and connect to it on my computer and try to connect to the VPN. And as you can see, after refreshing the page, my IP changes to the IP of my home network. And there you go, that's how you set up a VPN at home. Thank you for watching this video, I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to leave them down below in the comments. And as usual, I want to thank my patrons, the people who support this channel, people such as Tim, Mitchell Valentino, Ray Piria, and many, many others. Thank you guys for watching once again, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.